Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about an introduction to circuits, which is an important topic. In the bigger umbrella of electricity and magnetism, sometimes circuits are treated as their own unit. I'm going to treat this as almost its own unit. We're also going to be talking about circuit elements and how to understand potential difference, the hardest concept in all of high school physics to understand well. So, But I'm going to talk you through it, and then if you can understand potential difference, you can understand the cause of electrical current, like why electrons flow over a conducting wire. So first, let's start by talking about what a circuit is. So first of all, a circuit is just a pathway for charges to flow through. Typically, this is going to be through a metal conductor, like a wire, but it could be almost anything, as electricity can flow flow through conductors, things that will allow electrons to pass over the surface of these atoms. If you're a chemistry student, we could say particularly things that have ionic charges are good conductors, and of course anything with metallic bonds, where the outermost electrons are held very loosely, make great conductors. Alright, one thing at the beginning I do need to mention is I'm going to be using diagrams and we need to talk about a symbol for a circuit diagram that uses a wire. And first of all, a wire is a conductor will just be shown as a straight line, but if we need to make it go around a corner, typically we're going to have some hard angles there at 90 degree angles, even if the wire is more curved in actuality. All right, so let's get started with this. First of all, sometimes it is useful to draw water analogies with electrical circuits and learning about electricity, so I'm going to lightly use this. So I want you to imagine that there is a cliff with a pool of water stored at the top of the cliff. And the pathway of the water is blocked. If it wasn't blocked, it could fall down in like a small waterfall down here. And you would have this pool rush down and form a new pool down here. But let's say there are bricks blocking the way, and so that's not possible. All right, next I want you to start imagining these alkaline batteries that you've seen for various devices you've used in your home. You've probably seen similar things before. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a technical image here. It's not too bad. This is actually simplified, believe it or not. But just bear with me and you're going to be fine. So first of all, there are two main compartments for a battery with a big separation right here. The heavy black line right here is a separator. And what's going to happen is you have chemicals in here that have an extra excess of negative charge, so they have an overall negative charge inside here, and then you have chemicals outside here that have an excess of positive charge, so they are missing electrons to become stable, you could say. And in a way, these separated charges are stored energy, if you think about it. They are ready to be released, you could say. Kind of like this is stored energy up here, it's ready to be released. If we would just move the bricks and provide a path, then that water would start to flow in a current downhill, right? So let's think about that. Let's think about making a path for the water to be able to flow. We end up with a waterfall right here. And what we're going to say with that is I want you to think how we could do something like that for our battery without breaking this barrier right here. So these positive charges and these negative charges cannot jump across this battery and get from one side to the next. But is there any other way you can think of where these positive and negative charges could get to each other? Well, let's think about providing a pathway for the current to flow. We've already talked about conductors, wires as conductors, so let's go ahead and make a wire that'll conduct from one side of the battery to another and think about what would happen. You would have a spontaneous flow of electrons because they would repel each other inside here. Electrons repel other electrons, so they would be repelled as they go over here, and then they would be pulled or attracted over here because they're going to connect with the overall positive charge manganese oxide on this side and so you have a flow that stored energy causes a flow of electrons just like that stored energy of water up here causes a flow of water from a higher potential energetic state to a lower potential energetic state as it flows down over here now this analogy works as well with the following question do you think this would go on forever well, no, of course not. It would go on long enough for this water to become depleted, and in a similar way, this would go on long enough for the electrons to flow over here until they balance each other out. The excess negative charges balance out the excess positive charges. Okay, so that's actually what happens, is the electrons will flow around this way, but I need to talk to you about something that's unfortunate. Early on in research into batteries and understanding how batteries work, the scientists misunderstood and thought that the positive charges were going to flow around and go around this way and so they called this current we today if we're being precise we'll call it conventional current but when people talk about currents these days 
they mean positive charges flowing from the positive side of a power source over to the negative side of a power source. That actually does not happen unless you're talking about special materials here because for that to happen you would have to have the protons of the atoms. You would actually have to have the mass of the whole battery moving in this direction over here because protons are in the nuclei of atoms. So this is all built on a lie you could say. But there are many concepts in electricity where we assume we're working with something that is positive. So just as a reminder for instance you could think of the direction of an electric field would be the direction of a force on a small positive test charge. We assume that we're dealing with positive charges by default and so that's how I want you to think of this as well. We're going to assume that positive charges are going to be flowing around here even though that's a big lie. But we can roll with it because everyone else does. It's just unfortunate. I'm in favor of going back and changing everything but I'm also in favor of the metric system. Okay, and so let's talk about some of these crucial ideas that we need to review. So let's imagine you have a large charge right here and then a smaller charge, and it could be here at its initial position or over here. Let's think about the stored energy based on position that they have. So for the starting location, there's a small distance in between these two charges. This is going to be our equation for potential energy for two-point charges. So you would have the charge for the first one, like let's say the darker red would be Q1, the lighter pink would be Q2, R would be the distance between them. And for this first example, you could say that's pretty high. But if you want to compare this with this over here, notice the distance, the R value is now greater. And because of that, the potential energy is actually going to be lesser. One way to think of this is to say there's a lesser repulsion now when it's at the final position over here. So if we started from here and let go over here, we would actually just release it. We could just release this and it would move away up here on its own if this was stationary and locked into place. But you would say that there's a greater potential energy at this location and a lesser potential energy at this location over here. All right, now that's a useful idea, but it would be even more useful if we could figure out something for these points in space, like right here and right here, irrespective of how big this charge was. So if we could figure out a way to look at this initial point and this final point over here and compare them, irrespective of whatever charge we're using for our test charge, then that would actually be more helpful. And the way we do this is we just divide out the test charge. So I'm going to change the labels here a little bit, but if you take that potential energy that we had before and you divide out, let's say, one of the Q values, which will be our test charge over here, this value over here, you're just left with that larger Q value. That larger Q value is going to be left over right here. And this is something that's going to be more helpful. This is going to be measured in joules per coulomb because this is measured in joules. Joules is our catch-all unit for work and for energy. And down here, our units for charge are going to be coulombs. So our idea here of electric potential is actually more useful because it doesn't matter if we have a large test charge, like this Q0 is large, or if it's small, it doesn't matter because that Q value, that Q0 would be embedded up here and it gets canceled out and we're left just with the larger Q, you could say. And that's a concept of electric potential. I've got a screencast on these ideas. I'll put up links to these as I talk. Now this idea, this last idea I want to get to is the idea that if we compare the potential for this position to this position over here, there is a difference. There's a large difference in the work per unit charge that we could have at these different locations. In other words, if I drop the small positive test charge right here, it would experience a great deal of force over a distance. That would be work, force times distance, for every unit charge I put right here, right? Whereas if I put a similar test charge over here, it would experience a lesser force applied over our distance or lesser work would be done to it if it was dropped right here at this location as it would be repelled away going up, but with lesser force over a lesser distance. So the work per unit charge would be less at this location. Now the difference between this initial position and the final position in terms of their electric potential is called potential difference. This is the hardest concept to truly understand in all of high school physics, I'm convinced. All right, now if you can kind of hang in there for that, then we can say, well, there is a difference 
if you're going to compare the electric potential for the beginning part of a circuit, like as the charge leaves the battery, and the ending part of a circuit as that charge enters into the other side of the power source or battery, and so we have a potential difference again. So let's say that's our initial position. I'll call that my initial electric potential over here. You could say, I'll think about my initial potential electric potential over here, and I'll call that my final potential, and I'll call that my final electric potential over here. Here, and the difference between these two positions is going to be what's called a potential difference. So this is measured in volts and you probably can't see right here but this says 6 volts over here and if you've looked at batteries before they'll be measured in voltage which is a synonym for a potential difference. And that is the reason why you're going to have a flow of current from one end of your power source to another. There is a potential difference between your initial position and your final position. All right, now in order to not make this lesson too long, I'm actually going to need to break it up into two parts. I'm going to put a link up in the upper right to the second half of this lesson. Let's apply what we just talked about in the context of circuits and circuit diagrams. Hopefully this has been helpful. Please stick around for part two.